Oh, Keenan's so cool. <laughs> Keenan, Keenan's so awesome. Well, you're not the voice of Superman, are you, buddy? <laughs> no, seriously, that, this, is, this is like Cirque du Soleil. It's the biggest tent I've ever seen. I love you too. All right, simmer down. At one, point, at one point in my life, I was living in Providence, Rhode Island, and both of my children were attending Quaker schools. And one of the things that I loved about the Quakers was that they began every public gathering with a brief moment of silence to make the group more cohesive, thoughtful, and spiritually centered. So today, I think it's appropriate that we begin by breaking with Quaker tradition and celebrating the class of 2011 with a brief moment of noise. <laughs> Have you looked around? Maybe, maybe the world did end a couple of days ago. And this is heaven. Thank you, President Coleman, uh, trustees, faculty, students, and TV users all for having me here tonight. <laughs> I'd like to congratulate the class of 2011 for surviving Bennington College. I would like to congratulate Bennington College for surviving the class of 2011. And I would like to congratulate the parents of the class of 2011 for surviving you both. If you have financed your degree through scholarships and work study, you have my greatest admiration. If your parents have funded your education, please find an appropriate moment to get on your knees and worship them. <laughs> and if you're graduating buried under a mountain of student loans, <laughs> God help you. <clears throat> when I was asked to speak here, one of the first things to cross my mind was what tiny sliver of the commencement address universe has been left unexplored? <laughs> what possible wisdom or humor or pithy advice could remain untouched by the collective minds of commencement speakers that have come before me? Well, today I am going to go out on a limb and predict that none of the graduation speakers in the United States of America this spring are going to discuss a tradition that began here at Bennington College more than 35 years ago. The dress to get laid party. <laughs> Is it possible that another speaker has uttered those words this spring? I doubt it. I hope not. Anyway, I'm, I'm actually not going to talk about that too much, except to say that I will never forget a young woman who uh, spent the better part of a semester preparing for the party by welding a steel bikini, which she wore stunningly, if painfully, to the party. And I think the art department gave her credit for it. <laughs> so I, I guess I was asked to be here today because like virtually every other commencement speaker um, in history, I've achieved a relatively high level of success. The 1984 TV movie, I Married a Centerfold comes to mind. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I think that academic institutions think that success is like a contagious disease that will infect those that come in contact with it. Or, or it's like seeds or manure that can be spread over the graduating class so that they will grow into successful citizens. Uh, but I'm not sure that's going to work at all, particularly because uh, I'm practicing safe success. Uh, 
Oh boy, oh wow, that was bad. Uh, but seriously, being asked to speak in front of Bennington College students is a great honor and it's also terrifying. Uh, you are scary people. You are all so tragically and uncompromisingly hip. <laughs> so persistently cool, so iconoclastic, you're intelligent, you're wildly artistic, ravenously opinionated. And I know, I went here, I read less than zero. <laughs> I'm sure your professors and your parents will know exactly what I'm talking about. The late actor Peter Yusinov said, parents are the bones on which children sharpen their teeth. <laughs> I was just at my, my own daughter's graduation a couple of weeks ago and she still had the toothpick in her mouth, <laughs> just dislodging great chunks of my bones. Anyway, I asked her what she would like to hear at her commencement if I were speaking. And she said, just be profound, enlightening, and inspirational. So, back to the dress to get laid party. Uh, here's some trivia, which Liz already gave away. Bennington was actually my second college. I went to Syracuse University, for two weeks, two weeks. <laughs> I lived in a prison-like cinder block dorm with a thousand other freshmen. My roommate, Ira, was from Long Island and he was struggling mightily with identity issues and having absolutely none of me. He would say, Tim, this is college. You're supposed to have fun. You are my roommate. Roommates are supposed to be best friends. We are not best friends. All you do is read. Don't you want to have fun? Don't you want to do fun things like shopping? And, and I said, Ira, what would I shop for? And he said, clothes, clothes, clothes. Anyway, a couple of days later, I wound up stuffing all of my belongings into a sleeping bag and driving off into the night and of course, I didn't tell my parents. Uh, and during my next two years, I drove across the country a lot. Uh, I worked as a cook, a carpenter, I washed dishes, I started a floor tiling company, and I pumped gas. Yes, people used to pump the gas for you. Like, anyway, they did, so I'm not lying. Um, anyway, I eventually wound up here, like literally right here, sitting on my motorcycle, wearing my leather jacket uh, in all my unrelenting coolness and splendor. And I was thinking that I could spend a few years here on this hill to escape and or prepare for the real world. Okay. The one thing people talk about ad nauseum, including Keenan, around the time of college graduation is the real world. Are you ready for the real world? What are your real world skills? You're about to enter the real world. I imagine that it's part of my job um, to tell you about what to expect and to assure you that Bennington does in fact prepare you for the real world. Well, <laughs> well here's the thing. There is no real world. I mean, there's a TV show on MTV called The Real World, but it's totally unrealistic. <clears throat> um, so, what is this real world that everybody talks about as you're about to graduate? Is it just a place that sucks? <laughs> a, a, a place where you have to be unhappy in a crappy job that grinds you down? What is this place that so many people refer to as if it's something you really want to avoid, but it's inevitable that you have to go there? <laughs> I honestly don't know. When people talk to me about the real world, I always think that it's capitalist propaganda. I mean, yes, you should go out and get a job and figure out a way to support yourself, but I mean, it's all real. 
whether you're writing poetry in a field or changing brake pads or sitting in a cubicle at Goldman Sachs. There's just one world and nothing in it is realer than anything else. Or, well, or, or maybe not. I mean, Einstein said uh, reality is merely an illusion, although a very persistent one. <laughs> I mean, I have worked with Donald Trump as an actor. <laughs> Twice. Was that real? <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> what I've discovered after 30 years of being a professional actor is that I have absolutely no use for reality whatsoever. I have played an astronaut, a cowboy, a soldier, a doctor, a lawyer, a cult leader, a priest, a lifeguard, a writer, a musician, a pilot, a drug addict, a policeman, a murderer, a teacher, a reporter, an artist, a musician, myself, a man, a woman, gay, straight, bi, and, needless to say, Superman. <laughs> so I think it's pretty obvious that I've done quite well avoiding reality. I could never have been all or probably any of those things in my lifetime, but as an artist, I have pretended to be all of them. So, do I live in the real world? Frank Zappa, you have him in your minds? He said something very interesting on this subject. He said, the important thing in art is the frame. For painting literally, for other arts figuratively, because without this humble appliance, you can't know where art stops and the real world begins. You have to put a box around it, because otherwise, what is that shit on the wall? Actually, I happen to disagree with Mr. Zappa. I do. Uh, I disagree that there is a way to separate art from the real world. In fact, it's been one of my missions as the president of the Creative Coalition to get Americans to understand and acknowledge that art is in our lives every day. That art is part of our real world. But. Trying to define the real world doesn't even matter. It's just a bunch of mundane stuff. What matters is the truth. And I do like the metaphor of the frame because I think how you frame your life is what your challenge is. That's how you recognize the truth. And that's important. Not what's real, but what's true for you. And that's a lifelong task and one that should be taken on with everything you've got. And that's what art is. It's taking things that exist, whether they're pigments or sounds or stories or movements, and framing them in a way that makes them emotional and accessible, that puts them into the context of truth, so that when you're standing in front of a painting or watching a dance or hearing a song or sitting in a dark theater and tears are running down your face or you're laughing uncontrollably, you realize that you have been struck by the truth of what being a human is. As I have said, I have no use for reality except as it serves as a tool for discovering what is true. And sometimes you look at the frame and you still say, what is that shit on the wall? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, Here's some of the best practical advice, advice that I've ever found, and I will pass it on to you. It's from a book called All I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. <laughs> Seriously. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt someone. Flush. <laughs> Learn some and think some and draw some and paint and sing and dance and play and work every day some. 
When you go into the world, watch out for traffic, hold hands, and stick together. Now, you can apply those things to pretty much any complex problem, and it still kind of works. Okay, here are 10 things that I will pass on to you from my experience that I know from having hung out on the planet for a long time. One, you reach adolescence and you spend the rest of your life trying to get used to it. <laughs> Questions like, does she like me? How's my hair? Am I cool? They don't go away. <laughs> Two, it goes fast. Before you know it, you will look at your watch and realize that, oh, it's quarter till dead. <laughs> you will take your age, you'll multiply it by two, and it will equal pine box, six feet under, pennies on your eyes. Three, always keep an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. Now... I think that uh, probably most of you have done the first part and probably many of you the second part. But just remember, if your brain does fall out, pick it up and put it back in. Four. Uh, this one is pretty radical, so bear with me. Some of the things your parents have said might be true. <laughs> Have your elders ever said to you, maybe you'll understand when you grow up? Well, that's pretty hard to swallow, but sometimes it's absolutely correct. And we'll come back to that. Five, when your dream comes true, it's no longer your dream. So always have new dreams ready so you don't run out. Because if you don't have a dream, you're done for. Six. It is your obligation to fail. Without failure, success will never be as sweet. So take big risks and do yourself a favor. Screw up. Seven. Don't be an asshole. I wish there were a more polite way to put that, but there's just not, and I think it's self-explanatory. <clears throat> Eight, there will be trouble. Okay, let's talk about trouble. It will come. There is absolutely no way to avoid it, even though parents of my generation have done everything. We've worked so hard to protect you from it, but that's okay, really. The hallmark of a successful life is not avoiding trouble, but how you deal with it when you're in it. And I've had my share. When I graduated from Bennington, I was a practicing alcoholic. <laughs> no, that, I mean, it's true. It wasn't, it wasn't that funny to me. Um, and the thing about it is that nobody knew. Uh, but I was in deep trouble, and I was using all of my energy to hide the problem from my friends and my loved ones and from myself. And I'm not telling you this to be grim or to proselytize, but because something happened that I'm very proud of, and that's one of the biggest successes, successes of my life. I changed. When trouble came... <laughs> when trouble came, I changed and things got better. So keep that in mind when trouble comes, whether it's big trouble or something much less serious, you can change. And that's number nine, change. Don't be afraid. With a little grace and a little courage, you can change the course, the course of your life if it goes bad. 10, love. Um, this, this is another thing that my daughter suggested me, to me about making a commencement speech that I left out earlier, which is that I shouldn't be afraid to be sincere. So here it goes. Love is pretty much the whole thing. Love is the truth. So 
Go out there into the real world and hunt love down like a ruthless, snarling predator. <laughs> Give love away like a drunken pirate on shore leave. <laughs> love your friends, love your parents, love your children, love your, your sisters and brothers, love your man, love your woman. Love what you're becoming, not what you are. Love what you do, not what you want to be. Love your dog. Your band, your new apartment, your car, Brooklyn. <laughs> Love is the truth. So put a frame around it and put it on the wall and every once in a while, ask yourself how it looks. And if you don't like it, change it. And that brings us back to number four. When I actually was in kindergarten, my mother read me a book by E.B. White called Stuart Little. Uh, about the mouse that grows up in a family of, of humans and Stuart falls madly in love with the bird named Margallo who flies off and leaves him at the end of the story. Well, that absolutely killed me. My five-year-old heart could not handle it when the lovers didn't live happily ever after. So I wrote E.B. White a letter. <laughs> and I told him that I hated the ending of his book. <laughs> and he wrote back to me. And he said, maybe you'll understand when you grow up. <laughs> and as much as I hate to admit it, he was right. In the last paragraph of Stuart Little, our hero sets out in pursuit of his love. It reads, Stuart rose from the ditch, climbed into his car, and started up the road that led toward the north. The sun was just coming up over the hills on the far right. As he peered ahead and into the great land that stretched before him, the way seemed long, but the sky was bright, and somehow he felt that he was headed in the right direction. My greatest hope for all of you is that you will look back on your time here not as an escape when you were avoiding the real world, but as preparation for a passionate, ongoing journey to frame your lives, to pursue what is true, and to know love. I hope that tomorrow morning you wake up, climb out of your ditch, get your diplomas, get in your cars, and somehow feel you're going in the right direction. So watch out for traffic, hold hands, and stick together. Thank you.